you know, it, it's a weekly event in R511 and weekly events include guests. And I've had fabulous guests for the last three semesters, just, just tremendous guests. Uh, and I've created a playlist the last semester is so great. But oftentimes we have one guest that's just fabulous. Today we have this two guest thing going on, two fabulous guests. And if, if either one of them was here, they could fill up three hours by themselves. But we have two people who have worked, been working together in the area of open education, in particular open education practices, services, resources that they'll be talking about. And it, we'll have some questions wrapped around um, the use of them and talking about where their research might be headed today. But Sam Nadu, in addition to working on open educational resources with, with Sharonika, uh, has been a major player in the field of distance education. In fact, he is the editor of the journal Distance Education, of which I am one of the reviewers. And so I have, I have been really an, an admirer of his work because Distance Ed is not just an important journal in the field by itself. It's a tier one journal and what's called the Social Science Citation Index, SSCI. So it's been influential all around the world. And he hasn't just done a three-year editorship like most journal editors do. He did a couple of decades beyond, you know, more than a couple of decades. I think he's up to year 23 maybe or something like that. Is that close some? So, yeah, so yeah, he started when he was four years old. He's now 27. He's been doing this for 23 odd years. You know, and and I unfortunately I, down in the basement. I'm on the second floor right now. And down in the basement is Sam and Sharonika's uh, newest book on open education practices, of which I've got the forward to the book. And maybe Sharonika has that book. She can show us and talk a bit about that book. Maybe even before she, maybe if, if it's not part of your slides, maybe you can mention that book and talk to us a little bit about it. Um, Sam and um, Sharonika have a chapter in my MOOCs and Open Ed in the Global South book. And I'm delighted to have, and Sam has two chapters in this book. He has one for when he was working in Fiji as well as uh, the one that he did with, with Sharonika. She's in Sri Lanka. And I had the great pleasure of presenting last year twice to teachers at the Open U of Sri Lanka and talking to them about instructional strategies that are engaging. We talked about motivation last hour and engagement. So, so yeah, we, we are very, very interested in how to engage learners in unique pedagogical practice, practices with online environments. This semester, you will read in week 14. This is week eight. In six weeks, you'll read from them um, the impacts of authentic assessment on the development of graduate attributes. So we're going to find out what graduate attributes, what you all should learn and have so you can get a job. That's, that's part of what they're going to focus in on when they present. Here, they're going to do a 15 minute presentation or overview. Um, and so, you know, you've got their, I've sent you all their bios. I've sent you a, a little bit uh, uh, about what they've written and so forth. Uh, Sam was a pro vice chancellor at, in Fiji, the University of South Pacific. And so he's recently migrated back to Melbourne uh, with his family there. And Sharonika was the de dean at the uh, uh, open you of, uh, of Sri Lanka, yeah, but she says she's no longer dean, and now she can have fun again being a faculty member. I think that's what she said. Um, I want to point out that my new book came out a week ago today, Transformative Teaching Around the World, Stories of Cultural Impact, Technology Integration, and Innovative Pedagogy, with 40-some stories of former Fulbright teachers who took my class, and then they their picks to start the book. They were short, emotional. Story. Um, so that's a couple of things. I want to point out one more thing. I've been jogging 711 days in a row. Sam here is a much better runner than I am, but he's never jogged 711 days in a row. Uh, and he can run fa faster. He can run further, you know, and so forth. But but um, he, he's got my challenge to Sam is when he gets to 700, I will buy him a shirt like this that says the 700 Club. And then he can have... He can get a shirt sent to him in the mail. I'll send it to Australia. Uh, maybe I'll send I'll send a couple of them. You know, so um, uh, you know. So I think 
today we're going to hear from two people who have been in the field for a few decades um, and know the evolution of, of educational technology, e-learning, open and distance learning, and kind of tell you about and tell you a story about the evolution of this field. And, and, and being in an intro class like this, you want to know the history, you want to know the present, and you want to know the future and where it's going. So we'll get some of all that in their presentation. Um, so Sharonika, um, and we do have a Jamboard. So again, Sume posted the Jamboard. Sume put the Padlet back up again for the Padlet for this one. And um, we've got Bandura's obituary in there now. Okay, the Jamboard, okay. Uh, and then put the Padlet as well about open education practices and you know your perceptions of open education um, services and open education resources uh, and so forth. I'm curious to read that. So now I will let Sharonika take over. I'm going to mute my mic so I don't interrupt. And this is being recorded to the cloud. Okay. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Kurt. And hello, everyone. Uh, it's very nice to uh, be here meeting you all. And thank you very much, Kurt, for inviting us. Uh, it's quite exciting uh, to talk about our collaborative uh, activities uh, for almost two, uh, two decades now. Okay, uh, so um, shall I start with my slides? Uh, okay, right. So let me share the screen uh, because we uh, put up few slides to support our um, uh, what, what we are going to share with you about our collaborative journey uh, in technology, education, and design. Okay, so um, actually the collaboration started uh, in 2003, uh, when SOM was uh, introduced to us by SEMCA uh, to conduct an e-learning workshop for the OUSL staff, because online learning was so new for us, we didn't know. Uh, so uh, he came and did a professional development workshop on e-learning for us in 2003, January. That was the very first time we met. I met SOM. Uh, after uh, actually that was the initiation of online learning at the Open Institute of Sri Lanka. I should mention that here, and I was among the first uh, few people who uh, started online uh, courses at the OUSL uh, after SOMS workshop. Uh, afterwards, um, again with Commonwealth of Learning support, uh, we started developing an innovative uh, program on uh, innovative master's level program, which is out of tradition. We are, you know even though I am from the Open Institute of Sri Lanka. Uh, actually, I've been an undergraduate uh, there as well. I did my first degree also at the Open Institute of Sri Lanka so, uh, and the teachers. So uh, still we, we, were, we were, I mean, in our context, the technology was not being that much used, you know, uh, with the resources and the traditional ways and all. But this, in 2003, again, later 2003, so uh, again came back to Sri Lanka as a facilitator for professional development of uh, staff of the Faculty of Education, where I come from. I was a very junior academic at that time, uh, where he introduced this innovative um, uh, learning approach, a scenario-based learning, SBL. Scenario-based learning, which was totally new for us, but now uh, we have absorbed it into almost all our programs now. Uh, so I think he will talk about it later um, uh, if you, I mean, uh, details, but this was, an, uh, this was the, uh, actually the collaboration started here, the real collaboration, because this led up, this went on to two years to develop this program, series of workshops. And then we continued from that, then came OER. I mean, since 2003, we started, we kept on, uh, you know, one after the other, there were different, uh, a uh, lot of things are professional development because SOM was a great mentor for us, facilitator and guiding us on this, uh, you know, uh, different things as even OER was introduced to us uh, in a workshop conducted by him in 2013 uh, on ICT and OER integration. So uh, we started creating OER based e-learning courses uh, and then uh, we move on to OEP, Open Educational Practices, from Open Educational Resources to Open Educational Practices. That was around 2016. Then we moved on to MOOCs, 
yeah, we did uh, we did the first MOOCs at the Open University of Sri Lanka again, so I'm facilitated. So it was it uh, and still we continue this journey continues. Uh, so that's where we got the article in your book on our first MOOCs. Uh, so that's a summary of our collaboration and it still continues. It has been very productive and rewarding. So I will just uh, go through quickly um, about the key, uh, key um, com components of it. Uh, and by the way, in between, I mean, if you want to uh, ask anything, I mean, that's fine. Uh, so this uh, scenario-based learning uh, was introduced, uh, as I mentioned, for our um, master's program, uh, Master of Arts in Teach Education. That's for teach educators. So it took a totally uh, uh, different approach using authentic learning scenarios. So at that time, the term authentic was also new for us. I mean, now we everybody's using authentic learning and authentic assessment and everything, but 2003, SOM introduced it to us uh, because these were all based on scenarios, learning scenarios, which are very close to the practitioner's real life work. So we spent a lot of time developing these scenarios in groups. The whole faculty worked with him. Uh, in, I mean, we took two years to develop this full program. These are all based on situated learning principles and a constructivist approach to learning. So I'm not going to go into details here, but it's actually, uh, we started with, I mean, we didn't have, uh, you know, even, we, we, we started with print-based materials, actually. Uh, we did all this uh, development of modules and the study guides, actually not modules, we start, this is the first time we started study guides and it was the first program at the OUSL without a final examination. It was totally, uh, you know, practical activity based uh, throughout, assess assessments were done throughout based on the scenarios, the learning activities, the assessment tasks, all linked with their real life activities because these are practitioners in the field. So it becomes very relevant for them. And finally, uh, they achieved through a learning portfolio. They developed a learning portfolio throughout and so we introduced that concept to us as well. And we are continuing this up to now. And we have integrated this into other programs as well. And I'm happy to say we won uh, an award of excellence for uh, distance education materials, uh, you know, at the low end, because we started just with print materials and some CDs. Later on, we developed online courses as well. Uh, so these are some pictures of uh, those uh, uh, achievements or outputs. And of course, from the beginning, that's the other thing so um, influence from the beginning, everything thing was linked with research. Everything, I mean, he started publishing, uh, I mean, we started together, not, I mean, he initiated and there was a team. So we started uh, publishing, uh, intensively around this scenario-based learning. These are two notable uh, key uh, book chapters uh, on how scenario-based learning promote uh, reflective practice in online and distance education, and then developing competencies of teach educators in the use of ed tech with scenario-based learning. So these are only two, but there's a lengthy uh, list of uh, publications that came out during that period. Um, okay, uh, so that that's, I mean, linking with research was uh, very good because we kept on improving and developing ourselves uh, with uh, some facilitation. Um, and um, then, uh, as I mentioned, then it came to the next step of open educational resources, which was also a new concept and open educational practices. Actually, those again uh, were a series of workshops where again the whole faculty at that time, when originally I was a junior lecturer uh, in 2003, uh, but uh, I, I was made the program coordinator of that innovative program. That's where I became to work very closely with Som and actually he was speaking the same language which I was exposed to at my doctoral studies at University of Wollongong, Australia. And I was longing to implement those things, which 
I couldn't do at that time, you know. So it was like very fortunate uh, that Som came and started talking the same language which I have been then. So I got this opportunity to uh, practice them in real life. So that's that's where the true collaboration began because the same mindset, I think, uh, I, I really got I was excited about this uh, uh, this whole process of uh, technology and pedagogy uh, linked together and innovative thinking and all. So open education resources, uh, actually that came in 2013, where then I was the dean of the faculty uh, by that time. Uh, then uh, again, I wanted to, I mean, there was the requirement to introduce this uh, integrating OER into education practices to all staff at the faculty of education, the whole uh, staff, it was like, like 30 people, I mean, small faculty. Uh, so some facilitated the whole faculty in some small groups, we created OER integrated online courses. Uh, so that's where the shifting of mindsets. Uh, so we did a lot of publications there about uh, transformational change from mindsets to mindstones. We did a lot of innovative uh, outputs, publications. And I think I should mention all these, um, all these uh, projects uh, or these uh, inno uh, or initiatives. The role of design was it because always SOM was emphasizing on this uh, designing the learning experiences. Learning experience design was the core in all these uh, innovations and shifting from these traditional. Uh, content-centric approaches to context-centric approaches. So as the Faculty of Education, where we are working with teachers, teacher educators who are practitioners in the field, this was very relevant and it was all very learning-centered. And he introduced this learning engine, um, maybe he might talk about it later, where the learning scenarios, We now once we started the scenarios, we worked with that approach, scenario-based learning throughout and integrated OER there. Now, when the OER came, we integrated OER into the learning scenario. So that uh, became the you know, working uh, of the scenarios with the support from the open educational resources uh, and achieving the learning outcomes. Then of, again, we had a lot of publications during that time. Now, I think Soms uh, influence, I also started writing a lot. Uh, then we won some awards for best practices uh, on our work around these things. And uh, these two important uh, books, the outputs, uh, these were stories. These were stories of the practitioners who engaged in these uh, innovative projects. The first one is the integrating OER in education practices. That is the stories of our faculty of education staff. Next, we work with school teachers in all over the country. We have nine provinces, so we visited Sri Lanka several times and we all traveled working with teachers, school teachers. And the second publication is their stories, integration of o OER into school education. And we developed them as well. And they asked, we published their stories. And then we came to the MOOCs. Uh, the, we call them CPD MOOCs, Continuing Professional Development MOOCs. Again, those MOOCs were on open educational resources and open educational practices. See, uh, very, uh, four uh, short MOOCs, uh, all based on that same learning engine, the scenario-based learning and integrating OER. So we call it designing MOOCs with a difference. Maybe some can elaborate on how it, it was different from the traditional uh, way of uh, doing MOOCs. So this was another exciting engagement and where we again did these publications, the book, uh, our third book, Pathways to Open Education Practices, where Kurt gave a very, very nice uh, forward to us, uh, very motivating for, forward for us. And also we had a um, webinar where Kurt again um, contributed as a resource person, and we had the chapter book chapter in your book, uh, the MOOCs and Open Education. That was uh, a good uh, opportunity to share our experiences on MOOC design. Uh, okay, so 
and another thing i want to mention all in all these uh, things uh, in addition to this uh, design we we approached this through action research first and then we uh, moved on to design based research dbr we became interested in design based research so we realized all these things were improving the designs in every cycle so we um, used design based research approach and the interest in evaluate impact evaluation impact evaluation again uh, so much uh, very um, interested in uh, you know evaluating the impacts of what we are all doing and he initiated uh, we, together i mean we developed this oep open education practices impact evaluation index uh, i think again so can elaborate on it later on but that's another a uh, novel thing um, so we have done some publications around that as well we created this instrument we now we have validated and another publication in line uh, so this is uh, based on this uh, big project we had uh, all over the country with the school teachers row for d project uh, idrc uh, the row for d project uh, cut you know we are a lot of uh, people from the global south uh, did uh, did projects on open integrating open educational resources so we did it in sri lanka so uh, we together with som so that's uh, okay so that, that's a summary of uh, summary of our collaborative initiatives um, i think i'll stop there and uh, let kurt ask some questions and som so can elaborate thank you Yeah so before I ask my questions I'm going to ask some questions and talk, and talk a little was that 40 what was that called again for 40 projects row for the r o research on open educational Rof, resources road, for development row for road 40 yeah. was that conducted by people in South Africa yeah they're coordinated by from South Africa okay yes so yes. so if my students were to look that up they would look for um road 4d road for development yeah. okay. actually it's this uh, publication adoption and impact of oer in the global south uh, okay. Cheryl uh, Cheryl Hodkinson and uh, yeah. Patricia Rinto yeah okay yeah 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 so that was with this book with Yuri and somebody yeah. uh, suggested that we have those folks in there but anyways there are people from south africa in this um i want to point out that this week last week and the week before you're reading about constructivism you're reading about authentic learning so all the things that sharonica was talking about situated learning were in the articles for the last couple of weeks so it's really appropriate for you to now talk about how you operationalize that in creating open educational resources and scenario based learning i'll also say that the school of ed at indiana university was one of the leaders in scenario based learning when the school of ed was built in the 1990s people were doing scenario based and so much so they spun out a company called wisdom tools doing scenario based learning and um there were a couple of faculty who were heavily into it so iu was on the cutting edge of some of this um stuff that that, that sam was talking about uh and so scenario based learning it can be it can be rather complicated um it takes some time to set it up it can be kind of expensive too or it can be low cost it has a wide wide vary it depends on the fidelity and authenticity and the, how much you want to put into it but if if you're a company creating a, a scenario based learning when you're building a new plant or a, you know a new facility in another country and you're trying to do cultural sensitivity training or something like that you have to do a lot of work on the front end to set all that up so it's it's it's, it's not simple case based learning which is another offshoot or option related to that which can be very um simple paragraph with a picture or a story and scenario based learning might be much more much more complicated a lot more thinking involved a lot more a lot more power in it um actually um the third thing i'll point out that i forgot to mention that sam you know he's he's got his degrees in montreal and concordia He's worked at the University of Waikato where I've spent some time in New Zealand. He's now in Melbourne. He worked in Fiji. He worked with uh, Sharonica in Sri Lanka. He likes to travel. So, you know, you can tell by the shirt he's wearing is, you know, uh he's a guy who likes to, to travel the world and and wear clothes that uh, you know, show that he's been in all sorts of places. But that's also true of this field. If you get into this field of distance learning and and open education, the conferences are all over you can meet people from all over the world and so last time i saw these two people were as in scotland right before the pandemic in edinburgh 
Um, so yeah, there is a benefit to studying distance learning and open education. And one of the benefits are people are doing distance ed and open ed and e-learning all around the world. And they have conferences all around the world and you can meet all in the, you expand your network, but you expand your mind by working in this field. You really do. You, you really, there's, there's a lot of hope and optimism in this field. As, as much as we hear the problems of emergency remote teaching and on and distance ed and all this, there's also a lot of hope uh, that's provided by the leaders in this field. And these are two of the leaders. Um, so that's just a side comment before we ask questions. Tom, you are listening to Sharonica. Did you want to add anything before we start with some questions for you? Uh, I could. There's, there's, uh, uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, the shirt is in response to uh, Kurt because no one knows color better than Kurt. So I thought, I got to wear some color. You know, I got this is the best I could do, but I'm still <laughs> good enough. You know, I, mean, uh, uh, yeah. I want know. one of those. I want, no, I've got one of those. I can go put it on. But no. I know, I know you have more than anybody. Uh, Thank you for the invitation. There is so much covered in Sharonika's presentation that we could be here all day. So I, I want to hear from you guys so that we are targeted. Otherwise, we could be going on and on about all sorts of things that you might say, yeah, yeah, enough, enough of that. You know, we've heard enough of that. So why don't we go to the questions, that, the burning questions that you have, and that, that way we can weave things in as necessary uh, that would be more meaningful, I think. So there are, I think we'll, we'll start with student questions because there are two questions for Sharonica already. And, and who has one of the, there's two of them. Would someone like to, to, to pose one of the two questions? Yeah. Natasha, you're smiling. I'm assuming one's yours. It's not, but I always have questions. So as yeah, soon okay. as you're done, Go ahead. I'll add some. Go ahead. Go ahead, Natasha. Well, I was, I just um, am very, very interested. First of all, thank you. That's an amazing presentation and it's amazing to hear about your work and especially, you know, your careers over time and it just so, uh, so really fascinating. I, I wanted to ask if you wouldn't mind just expanding a little bit more, talking about introducing uh, open education resources. And, um, and I'm just very curious just to hear more about it. Like what were those resources that, you found were most useful to be able to be adapted inside of a higher education institution. And then I think you were saying that one book was really about adapting them through schools, if I understood correctly, like primary, secondary schools, would really love to just hear as much as you're willing to tell us about what are those resources, which were the kinds of resources that were um, useful to instructors at those different levels and, and kind of like what did it take to be able to, um, you know, introduce them and 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 grow, you know, the use of those resources in in in, in a national education system. Uh, Sharonika, you want to have a go? Or shall I? No, so you you can. Uh, I mean, I can add in if I, if you want to. You can. Yeah. Um, uh, just just to back up a little bit, um, Tasha. You know, um, uh, about ten years ago, there was there was so much hype about open educational resources. And a lot of it is driven by the work of David Wiley and, and his colleagues and, and targeted more at the cost benefit of open educational resources. You know, people were saying that, you know, the publishers are charging a lot of money for copyrighted material, but that, that's one thing. In the developing world where, where people like us, Shronika and other people come from, in India, Africa, South Africa, South the open educational resources have a, a another another meaning because it's not just about the cost it's it's about equity it's about distribution the only way you can get resources out to people who don't have anything is through open educational resources uh and 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 so that was that imperative to get open educational resources out but you know, around 10 years ago, as Sharonika was saying, we started with people having no understanding of what an open edge, well, we didn't know. I mean, most of us didn't know much about it because the, the idea of what is open hadn't developed yet. Creative Commons licensing wasn't around 10, 15 years ago. The idea hadn't developed. So what is open? And now, of course, we have a very complex definition of what is open. You know, Open is not just about a different kind of licensing framework. 
you know, open has got to do so many other things to be able to take something, to adapt it, to modify it, to change, to chop and change, to add to that. I mean, Wikipedia is a very good example of what is really open. You can go in there and edit something, you know, and, and make it different, you know, and so it becomes a very collaborative thing. So there's a pedagogy there as well. So how do you take people who have no idea about what is open in terms of open educational resource and then get them to actually integrate that in their teaching. Now, we struggled with this extensively over a very long period of time. That's why you see in Sironica's slides, you know, words like changing mindsets from mindsets to mind storms, because these terms came to us as we were grappling with these issues in workshops. What are we trying to do? We are trying to shift people's mindsets about a particular type of educational resource. And it's not just the question of taking one as opposed to the other. It's, it's about doing more with the one type of resource than the other. So unless you change your learning and teaching transaction, unless you teach your learners and teachers to do different things with the open educational resource, then you're not usually uh, you're using full potential of the open educational resource. Not saying that, oh, this one is open, so this one's better. What, what more can you do? So, you know, getting teachers to engage with the content of that resource, allowing learners to engage with the content of that resource and how you integrate that in your teaching strategies is the next step in the process. And that's where sort of scenario-based learning comes in because that's how you get people to engage with the content. So as, as Kurt was saying, it's a very, it, it's very complex activity. So nobody, nobody told you that education was not complex, right? It is very complex. So, so that's how we, we change. We, we, we were working in the early days and Shornika will tell you more about this with not people just from the faculties of education but uh, teams of academics with engineering background, computer science background, uh, uh, natural sciences, chemistry, physics. So they didn't have any education background. So they would come to these workshops thinking that OERs are about technology, you know? And, 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 and the other scary thing was that anything on the web is an OER. You know, this is the kind of uh, mentality you're dealing with. So imagine yourself confronted with a workshop full of people like that. How do you take the group of people from that kind of understanding of an open educational resource to actually using it in, 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 and actually also developing their own? You see, that's the other step in the process. Dasha? Yeah, uh, can I yeah can I just add about the school teachers because you asked about the school teachers because uh, as some said we started with faculty of education and then we moved on to uh, school, school teachers are our student teachers you know we are training teachers at the faculty of education so we thought it should go to the school system but uh, there was uh, there were that was very challenging not unlike the university um, you know system because the language uh, issue was there language barrier was there so because uh, majority of uh, our teachers are teaching in our local languages Sinhala and Tamil English uh, only you know small uh, minority uh, in uh, the medium of uh, teaching is the local languages so when they were uh, introduced to the, they were excited as Som said everybody was thinking anything you found on the internet is open you know, you can use anything. So the, we introduced these copyrights things and the, about the Creative Commons licenses and all those things. They were excited to see such a vast amount of resources freely available for them to use uh, without any legal issues. They realized that if you read the stories, they are all available online. Uh, but then the language issue, because when they were searching, they found all English, you know, majority are in English. Uh, then, okay, Singhala was spoken only in Sri Lanka. So what happened was they started, because of the ability, uh, permissions given to adapt and, uh, you know, translate and adapt according to your context, because of the licenses, the permission, they started adapting and creating in their own uh, languages, Singhala and Tamil OER for their use in their context. So I think that's another mind change. And we published their stories as dream weaving. Some came up with very innovative words at that time, dream weaving open educational practices, because these teachers had this dream of, you know, working with a lot of resources and suddenly we 
introduce this vast pool of resources and then uh, it's not just using, using the resources but the ways in which you use them uh, because of the permissions given so that led them to the open education practices sharing especially sharing among everybody uh, and they were excited uh, so that we published their stories openly for the whole world to see uh, the links are there i mean I, I i can share the presentation later on with kurt so that you can upload it, it all the links are there the stories are amazing uh, the, because the, so that that was the impact. So that's where we were interested in impact evaluation. I think so we'll talk about it later on. Uh, we we saw the impact. So that's why we th thought of evaluating. This. So it was very exciting to work with these school teachers uh, and very rewarding experience actually. Seems okay. like you guys have answered like four out of the 13 questions I had in those responses. So it's probably good. I sent you those questions ahead of time. Um, and, and by the way, what my new book was supposed to be titled Making Impact, but my publisher decided nobody would find the book. And so he gave it all these all these other words are in the title so that people would find it. <laughs> it's a true story. And publishers change titles all I could I could go on and on about books and titles and so forth. Um and and, and my criticism, but my, you know, they're fair-minded people usually. Uh, but we we need to go to Sun Mei, who's gonna ask. Kyung Wei's question because Kyung Wei doesn't have audio. So can you ask the DBR question that's on the jam board, Sun Mei? Sun Mei is my TA here. You're muted, Sun Mei. <laughs> Sorry. Could you talk more about why you decide to change the action research to DBR? Okay. Um, action research to DBR. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, look, Shall uh, I start and then maybe some can uh, elaborate? <laughs> you for me to start. <laughs> because, I'll give you uh, a three word uh, answer. I'll give you a five sorry. word answer. Because they know Tom Reeves. Because <laughs> oh. <laughs> Tom Reeves does DBR, who was yep. my guest last night. Um, yeah. that's, that's a short answer. I'll let her give the long answer now. Okay. So originally, uh, I knew nothing about DBR, right? We knew we knew nothing. I mean, not I. I mean, we we knew only about action research as practitioners. So we started with the action research approach. But later on, we realized what we were doing in different cycles because when we were continuing with our work, we realized actually what we are doing is more than action research. We were developing new designs and designs and putting them into practice and refining them. And which is DBR then? Uh, some sent me these uh, articles uh, on DBR, uh, Tom Reeves and Susan McNee, the articles so I read. I read, I have a full file of uh, DBR uh, articles. Uh, so I got really interested and we really realized all this time we have been really doing DBR. Uh, so that's it. <laughs> so <laughs> actually it was not moving. We, we realized uh, we started a section, but it, it, it was actually DBR. So that's my short answer. <laughs> can, I, can, I, can I just add to that? Well, uh, it's a very critical question because an educational technologist, I think you need to engage with uh, these kinds of conversations. What's the difference between action research, DBR, in evaluation research as opposed to uh, experimental research? For example, one of the things that I studied uh, in the early days of my graduate education was a book called Campbell Stanley. And if you haven't seen it, quasi-experimental designs, I mean, it, 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 it was the quantitative yeah. paradigm. But it's a good question for Tom Reeves, you know, because, and I'm sure you've asked the question now, action research is, is a very legitimate and powerful research methodology. No, no, no doubt about it. Case study research is also uh, very powerful. But I think what DBR emphasizes is the role of design. That's right, that's Tom. Yeah, because I think it was a lot. Remember, Tom was initially uh, a great proponent of evaluation research. So the history of DBR or the emergence of the idea of DBR goes to evaluation research. Now, 20 years ago, uh, and then this is a question that Kurt asked us, evaluation was not accepted as, as, a, as a legitimate method of research in, uh, at the doctoral level unless at the doctoral level you produced a significant result in statistical terms, evaluation research was not competitive. Was, so we in the 1990s were dissuaded from doing evaluation research. At the master's level, evaluation research is acceptable. 
But when you come at the PhD level, how do you actually demonstrate significant impact? In evaluation research wasn't able to do that. So if you, but 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 I think we have moved on now, and and there's a lot of PhDs which are um, founded on evaluation research. But DBR takes evaluation research once further because it emphasizes the role of design, and 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 um, design in terms of a conceptual design of something whatever it might be, a teaching strategy or learning strategy or, or technological strategy, and then implementing and then collecting data from a variety of sources. Uh, so the difference between evaluation research and DBR is the role of design, whereas evaluation does not need to have design input. You can go and evaluate anything anywhere at any time without having input into it. DBR requires the input up front, the front end part of it, before you can collect data. Uh, that's the only thing that I was uh, wanting to highlight in terms of the differences between DBR, evaluation, action research, and case study research. So Chen has the next question. Chen is my doctoral student. Chen, you want to jump in here? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Dr. Bang. Uh, uh, so uh, thank you, uh, Sharonika, for your presentation. And in your presentation, I remember that you mentioned the uh, the, uh, uh, the scenario based learning, right? So I happened to finish some reading about the uh, the pro problem based learning from one of my foundational courses recently, and we have read something about the uh, the cognitive or constructivist perspective, some kind of theory. So I was wondering. Uh, what's the difference between the PBL and uh, S SBL? <laughs> yeah, and uh, is there some kind of facilitators there? Because when I read the, the theory about the PBL, um, they said that the facilitators is very key role to um, make sure to ensure the, the quality <laughs> or conduct of the, the problem based learning process. So I was wondering if there's some kind of similar roles in um, scenario based learning. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks for the question. I think Som would be the best person to uh, answer that. <laughs> uh, actually, they are, they are all based on authentic learning scenarios where problems are uh, inbuilt or the, there are challenges in the scenarios. I think they are problem based scenarios. Uh, so I think there's a link there, but uh, Som will elaborate. But uh, the, what, what, what's happening is we are the, the learner is uh, placed in a situation or a scenario which is closer to uh, his or her real life situation, real life context, where he's facing, he or she is facing a challenge, challenge, challenging situation in the scenario. It's not just a scenario, but it's a challenging. So that challenge is the problem which the person has to solve going through, uh, you know, the stepwise process of the learning activities, they, those all, all those things are inbuilt in the scenario. You, you face the scenario, you face a challenging situation, then you have to go through the steps of, um, you know, solving that, uh, you know, finding solutions to the challenge. Those are the learning activities the learner is engaging and to help the uh, help doing the learning activities, the resources are coming in. So that's uh, basically it. So uh, and the assessments are linked as well. When when they are going through each step, those are assessed. And that's why there's no final examination. Each of these things, uh, you know, uh, fed, feed to the next step. So that's uh, very briefly. I think Som is the best person to elaborate because uh, he introduced uh, it to us. Uh, but now we, we have realized the value and we are integrating it into all our programs now, almost all. Okay, so... Uh... And, and, and listen, uh, that, uh, the simplest answer to your question and at the undergraduate level, year one, I could simply say there really isn't a lot of difference. You know, I think that's, that's, that's the bottom line, right? But as you, as you read more into it and, 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 and look for more nuances, then there is a difference, you know. Um, fundamentally, as Shonika was saying, we come from a theoretical construct that is based on situated cognition. I mean, that, that's the fundamental point, you know, that, that, that cognition, that the way human beings understand things is within situations, within context, all right? 
See, and problem-based learning is a very good example of that. McMaster University, you know, in, in Canada actually uh, integrated that into the medical program. But, but the difference arises, everything doesn't have to be a problem for it to be a meaningful learning experience, which is why we thought scenario-based learning is probably a broader term than problem-based learning. Problem-based learning is a form of scenario-based learning, okay? Uh, take, for example, you know, uh, you know, we have sitcoms, right? Um, how many sitcoms do you know? Friends, Seinfeld, you know, the, these common ones, well, shows my age here, right? Um, but you see, when you see sitcoms, sitcoms don't always have problems, right? It's it based on a situation, isn't it? I mean, you, you look at episodes of Friends, which is a bit old now, they not norm, not always had a problem in the in, in the context, but the, the comedy is situated around around the, the a group of friends, you know, living together and, and the occurrences that arise as a result of that. So the thing about scenario-based learning, it, it's it's a broader con, it's a broader term than problem-based learning that is uh, that, that is that, that has grown out of this idea that learning is situated, that cognition is situated. And, and, uh, and, and that's the fundamental point. Both PBL and SBL are powerful approaches to learning and teaching. We chose SBL because we thought that every situation may not be a problem, isn't it? You know, and that's the only thing that is different about it. But, but I wouldn't go much further than that because the strategies that the teachers play in it, the, the learners play in it, the technology plays in it, that, that's part of creativity. That's where teaching comes in, you know, and uh, there's no boundaries there. I'm gonna jump in here because that was a great answer and better than I could have given, much better. And I know Amita has to leave shortly to, with, to be with her kids and she wants to ask a question before she goes back home. So go ahead, Amita. And Amita has a chapter in my new book. She talks about working through video conferencing professional development to her home country in Uzbekistan from the US um, and what she did with that. So go ahead, Amita. Hello, thank you for introducing uh, OER and MOOC experiences to us. Uh, currently, our country is also uh, interested in online um, uh, open education resources development and MOOCs, but um, they need a lot of, um, they're short on professionals. So I want to help my country, but I don't know where to get started. So how was your experience when you were getting started? How did you build a team? How did you manage a project and things like that? Thank you. Veronica can go for that one. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes, I think uh, at the beginning I was in the same. We were in the same situation as you. I mean, um, we had all those questions as well. Uh, actually, we had uh, even though we are a small country and we are the only open university uh, in Sri Lanka, I should mention. So we 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 always have these links with these international organizations like Commonwealth of Learning. Uh, and SEMCA, the arm of, uh, you know, this Asian arm of call, uh, which is called SEMCA. We had very, uh, you know, a close relations because uh, we used to get support from them. They're not very big support, you know, small scale support for professional development. That's what we needed, PD. So uh, as I mentioned in 2003, uh, actually, I joined the Open Institute in 1993. So uh, uh, then, I mean, we, we had very low, we, the technology integration was not, not uh, we had a lot of issues. I mean, not, not issues, I mean, very challenging situation, but we, we wanted to, as you say, we, we wanted, uh, you know, we had the need, but then how the key is professional development. So that's where SOM came in. I mean, we requested, we didn't know SOM, of course, we requested Sanjay. Uh, Sanjay was the other first key person at that time, Sanjay Mishra. Uh, he was a guest in my other class a few weeks ago. So yeah, he's 
He was the director, uh, sorry, Usha Reddy was the director, but Sanjay was also, you know, very young at that time. And uh, he was uh, project, uh, assist project somebody, project coordinator. So we all uh, met in 2003, actually. Uh, so that was the starting point, the professional development. So our staff development uh, center organized these workshops and I was just a participant. I was very young at that time, um, unlike so. Uh, <laughs> then uh, we continued continued that PD, you know, after that, when I mean, my, when I developed myself, I realized I'm, I became the head of the department, then I realized my staff, I mean, it's not only me, I mean, it's the faculty, then when I became the dean, I made it sure that the whole faculty got this PD again, so we, when we know this so is this excellent uh, facilitator, I mean, he's very good at, you know, making things happen in different ways, changing mindsets, and uh, so by that time, uh, we knew the effectiveness so we got him again we requested call with commonwealth of it always uh, with some support from external agencies and of course with the support from the administration of the open university all the vice chancellors have been very very supportive of all these projects we have about i think five projects by now five or six they were all projects uh, but those projects led you know they were like continuous professional development. We started uh, with small groups, then faculty of education, and as Soam said, it, it uh, moved on to the other faculties of the Open University of Sri Lanka. And then it even moved on to other universities, other institutions where I had links They when they invited Soam has been working and the school teachers. So it sort of expanded. Uh, so that's how it happens and it's still continuing. I mean, it's still happening, yeah, so. A, a couple of things to take away, Chen. I think, you know, in your position, I, I would say a, 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 you need to develop a small proposal, a short proposal of what you want to do, what the challenges are and what you want to do, and tie it with your institutional goals. Look look at the strategic plan of the university or the, or the uh, organization that you're working at. Try and um, find a, 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 a aspect of the plan which addresses this kind of an issue. If you're in a university, then it won't be too difficult. Develop a short proposal. Uh, don't make it too complicated. And people around the table here can help you do that. And then take it to your supervisor, convince your supervisor, take it to the vice chancellor, and then take it, as Sronika said, to an external agency that will fund it. Usually in the developing world, funding is an issue. But our experience shows that actually money is not the problem. There are a lot of people, such as the organizations that we are working, and if you're in the non-commonwealth part, there's the uh, Asian Development Bank, for example, in, in your part of the world. And of course, UNESCO is there you know, as well. And, and, and other we got the IDRC funding. IDRC, which is the International Development Research Council of Canada, you know, um, which which funded all of this work that Shonika is talking about. Uh, Google that and see if you can find some support from them. As Shonika was saying, not a lot of money is required. Ten thousand dollars will go a long way. So develop a proposal, seek funding, engage with it, and and you will see your lives are going to be transformed as a result of what you can do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the reason I am struggling is I'm in the United States. I am working here at IU, but uh, the collaboration needs to get started. And our issue is mostly cultural issues, like uh, even though I'm Uzbek. <laughs> so, you know, they don't have basic skills like project management, the email writing, you know, expectations like this kind of issues. So they need training in cultural, intercultural communication and other project management skills, I think. Yeah, well, yeah. a quick response is don't 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 think that that's that's your problem alone. You know, uh, the rest of the world is the same. Sonika and I went through the same sorts of problems, and, and language was an issue there. People couldn't speak English for for God's sake, you know. So right. how, how do you get people to talk about OER when they don't even understand the language? So you start with the basics, isn't it? You know, or, or sometimes you know, start with what you need to do, and these sorts of skills can be embedded into it because you know you. 
you can't say, listen, I'm going to teach you a language because then that becomes a different project, isn't it? So you're, you're not about teaching people how to manage email or manage project, but those sorts of skills will develop as a result of the work that we do. So, so you are an educational technologist, focus on education, focus on technology, and then design a workshop or get people like you know ourselves to sort of design a program and you obviously have that expertise uh, and then um, uh, work through a project. And this, this is a long-term thing. You know, 20 years down the road, look at yourself 20 years down the road and see yourself in, in the people that we are. Not going to happen, but you, the best you can do is get on the path. And you are already on the path. You made a great choice by coming to IU. That's a huge start, you know. That's your badge of honor, you know. And the rest is um, Allah Akbar. Leave it to God Almighty. It'll be all okay, you know. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. This thanks for asking. Yeah, thanks for staying long enough to ask that. It was a great question, and it's something other people might have wanted to ask themselves. Um, I've got a lot of questions queued up. We won't ask all of them because we're, we're not, we're not going to keep forever tonight, but I want to make sure we don't have a, another question from everyone here. Um, does anyone else want to jump in at this point before I do? Please jump in. Hmm. Can I ask another one? Sure. Do you mind? I, first of all, I just truly appreciate it. Um, do you mind talking a little bit about what your your the the kind of like minimum levels of technology or minimum levels of training that you saw were necessary to enable people, and particularly schools or your school systems, to to be able to do the kind of of work that you you know have grown them into? Yeah. Yeah, Shronika, you want to have a stab at that? Uh, sorry, um, it was not clear. Uh, there was uh, some disturbance yeah. and uh, uh, I right, couldn't get right, uh, right. that. Um, she's asking for minimal levels of competence, you know, and I, and I think um, what I found was, uh, what we found was that, you know, as long as you are, I mean, most of us are in a Windows or environment now, whether you're Apple user or, you know, uh, Dell user or whatever. We're using a Windows. So as long as you are able to uh, negotiate the web and um, and know how the web works and search for things and, and type, you know, uh, then that was all that was required. Not not much more than that was required. Yeah, I and, think. And the sorry, just to ask a, a quick follow up question. And so your schools, like your primary schools or secondary schools, have that connectivity to be able to support the kind of, of learning that you're, you're, you're okay. All right. Yeah. Um, well, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, my connection is a little bit, you know, shaky. So I think uh, Kurt has put, I think the motivation, I, I heard uh, that you were talking about motivation uh, when we joined you in the class. I think motivation played a big uh, thing there because they were in thirst of, uh, you know, looking for these new things. And you, when you just go and introduce, I mean, they got so motivated in absorbing. I mean, it, it's very challenging. It is very challenging, but with the leadership they needed they needed leadership you know somebody has to give the so we identified leaders in different so, so and then the facilitation the continuous facilitation continuous dialogue uh, you know the support uh, giving them um, all this you know uh, the support was very essential so that they see this is even though uh, it's challenging you could face these challenges uh, which is, uh, you know, becoming a productive because they were really applying them in their school context because they saw the value of uh, all these concepts. And they, I mean, they didn't know. They, they, those were all, uh, you know, novel, most of the things that, so that cognitive load was also there. Uh, you know, technology, the pedagogy, even the pedagogy was novel because the, traditionally, the you know, they're used to this, um, very teacher-centered methods, but when we are talking about learning, moving to learning-centered and situating them, it was difficult even with the faculty. So we would know how difficult it was to change uh, the faculty, uh, the faculty staff, uh, so the teachers. Uh, so, but we may, I mean, we came there, I mean, maybe not 100%, uh, but still we are very happy that uh, that happened through, uh, it was continuous, I mean, we were continuously engaged with them. I think that's the good thing. I mean, so many, I mean, our collaboration, it's not only the project, even out of the project, 
throughout, we were continuously engaging and facilitating and supporting them to overcome the challenges. Yeah, all, 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 that, all that is important to touch, but I think what you're trying to get at is, is the hardware and connectivity. Look, that is, that is a problem, in, in, more so in the developing world than anywhere else. But, but even in our lifetime, so that has improved and it is going to improve. So you don't throw up your arms and say, oh, they don't have connectivity, so we can't do it. But it's going to get better, right? And, and, and people are developing local area networks. And, and for example, things like there's a tool that Commonwealth of Learning has developed, which is called Aptus, which, which uh, enables you to work in a networked environment, but you don't have to have, to have connectivity to the internet. So there are technical solutions. And Kurt, Kurt will know all of this, you know, that, that so, so you, what is, well, what are you going to do? You can't say because you don't have connectivity, therefore you, we can't do it. You have to find solutions. And if they are not there now, it will come. It will come about in the future, hopefully. And, and because that's the way we are going, using, you know, uh, we're not going the other way. So yeah. Omira, before she left here is saying, um, she's interested in learning entrepreneurship basics for uh, learning entrepreneurships, uh, how to get started and how to, make, how to build those connections. Any thoughts there about learning entrepreneurships? If, if I can sort of take a step, uh, first of all, I would, if I had the opportunity, I'll ask you, what do you mean by learning entrepreneurship? Do you mean the, uh, the, um, the ability to engage in learning in innovative ways? Because that's one meaning of learning unto entrepreneurship. Another could be that, you know, you're talking about how learning can be um, used for business development. Is that what you mean? Right. So, yeah, yeah, second one, yeah. If it's the latter, then the, the world is your oyster because there is so much opportunity in, um, in, in, in small business sector on how you can apply your expertise in technology. For example, I know a little company, uh, uh, a business, uh, a new startup in Melbourne, which is called Max Me. Max Me is about maximizing me. You know where the Max Me comes from? maximizing me, maximizing my potential, my ability through the use of technology. So makes me, where, where do you think the, the, the power of makes me comes from? The power of makes me comes from how to get people to, to reveal their, 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 their energy, their power. And so your studies on learning and cognition and technology and the theory of how human beings uh, develop ideas is critical. Where would you go if you wanted to empower somebody? You have to go to an understanding of the theories of learning because, and that you guys have that. Nobody else in any other program at any university would have that apart from learning technology. So there's your power. You can use your knowledge about learning theories and cognition and human competence to develop a company which enables people to maximize the potential. You see how important understanding of cognition is? And you get that from programs like this. So do we have another question? Or should I, uh, Katie turned on her mic, our camera. So I'm assuming Katie does have a question. Yeah, I think you were, you were jumping in earlier. Go ahead. I do have a question. I'm interested in, the education of educators and looking at brand new teachers getting into the field, because I know that especially over the next next decade, that's going to be a big deal. Um, looking at how education in a K-12 environment has evolved, what are your thoughts on how um, those individuals should be encouraged to use um, these resources in that environment. I, I'm in a school district, I have children in a school district that's very regimented. So um, there are six elementary schools and whatever an assignment is on Tuesday at this elementary school, every other student in, in that same grade is having the same experience across the district. And we are the probably the top or one of the very top school districts in the state. Um, and they found that this formula works. There's a number of reasons I think that that's probably true. But, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of not only how teachers getting into the field would, would consider this, but also people who are starting new jobs in a, in a uh, place like this, who they're given 
here's what you're doing today and here's how to do it, you know, and here's the resources you're going to use can enrich their learning or, you know, do we start with those resources and build out or do we start with the textbooks and sort of use the open resources as supplemental? That's like three questions. I apologize. <laughs> Uh, uh, do you want me to have a step, uh, Shronika? Yeah. Uh. Well, um, okay. Actually, my my connectivity is getting bad. I mean, this connectivity is a big problem here in our country. Even for school teachers, uh, that was the biggest challenge: the connectivity, the use of technology, especially in the rural areas. The teachers face a lot of difficulties. Actually, because of the projects, they got some of the schools got the internet connectivity. The schools they were able to convince the principals that you need technology. You know, that's that sort of thing. Uh, but maybe that's really linked with your thing as well. Uh, okay, so yes, we do also, uh, we have this traditional way of, you know, setting things, everything happening in the same way and, but what once you in once you expose them into these uh, novel ways and uh, show the you know show how it uh, changes i mean how it and the other things we we let them involve their students also because uh, like the students are more um, more interested and more excited and more um, well they are more exposed to technology use of technology sometimes the teachers are not uh, they are a little bit reluctant to change, you know, the changing is a little bit difficult for them, but when you uh, get them together, when we give them activities, I mean, our, our workshops are real workshops, you know, it's not just giving lectures. Our workshops are like practically learning by doing, you know, in the workshops, the, at the workshops itself, they did, you know, these things developed and they, you know, uh, how they integrated really and they presented and we had uh, we had a space where everybody shared their experiences with each other so they saw helped each other as a community so all these things happen during our workshop we facilitated them to create this sort of communities of learning so that uh, they were helping because everybody's like in the same boat right they, everybody's facing the same problems so they were helping each other and they were trying to solve uh, you know, and the ministry was, uh, Minister of Education was supporting us as well because we can't do anything in the schools without the permission. So the permissions were given. Uh, I'm happy. I mean, maybe they didn't even, they didn't really understood what's happening, but still they gave the permission for us to, uh, you know, go ahead. And I was invited to do uh, even uh, additional workshops for teacher uh, teachers uh, to introduce the concept of open educational resources. They realized the value of it. You know, so we distributed our publications. We had websites, open websites launched and uh, giving, I mean, showcasing it everywhere, what's happening. So it started little, but I think it's expanding. But yes, of course, the challenges are there. A lot of challenges are there. Uh, still, uh, I think you have to start at some point uh, and keep on doing it. That's why, because I'm very passionate about teacher professional development. I've been a teacher myself for a decade, school teacher. So I know the challenges faced by school teachers. Uh, so I'm working with school teachers uh, like, uh, you know, very closely uh, facing their challenges with them, you know, together we are trying to solve problems and always I make them a com learning community. Uh, yeah. So I, I hope I, that answered a little bit, maybe someone can uh, add so I, agree. Okay. I had a project, Katie, uh, with rural teachers in Indiana for five years and you have to build community, as she says, and cohorts to go through it, but you also have to start with successes and you don't start with learning theory. That's a big, quick way to turn teachers off is to teach them a bunch of learning theory on the front. And you have to show them what they can do. And then after that, oh, this is the learning theory, by the way, that, you, that we, are, we are abiding by when we did that. Oh, okay, yeah, okay, great, you know? But they have to have that, that sense that they can apply something in their own practices and take away. Once they can see something that's easy to implement and then they can do it in their own classes, you can teach them all of them all, a whole bunch of theories after that, sure. You know, because they've already got something they've benefited from. So I can send you the articles. Uh, if you send me in, um, an email, ask for the ticket project. It was the Teacher Institute for Curriculum Knowledge about the integration of technology. And we ran it in rural Indiana for five years. And um, get the ticket. We call it get the ticket. <laughs> uh, so Sam wanted to jump in there. Uh, Sam, did you want to add to that or no? Just a quick 
Quark, because I, I hear very loudly what Katie is saying. In, in a situation, what Katie was describing, if if, if Aiden broke, why, why fix it? You know, people would say, look, we were doing fine. We're, we're, we're all good. You know, if people are getting judged, so what's the problem here? And that's a huge challenge. So um, advocacy is, is very important, but I think slow and steady in your situation would be, would be try and, um, if I were you, try and identify some blank spots, you know, identify some weak spots, some alternatives, you know, few and far between they might be and address them. When they see, as Kurt was saying, when they see a benefit somewhere, then you introduce other things, you know. But what, what if, if everything is hunky-dory, things are chugging along, you know, why bother? You know, no one's going to listen to you. So what's the problem, you know? And then, but you, you've got to fill a gap. Where is the gap? You know, unless you fill a gap, nobody's going to listen to you, you know? Right. Exactly. We have a ticket model. So it took us eight years to figure out what the model was, but we came up with a model and it's a, you, you might, it's a blended, blended a hybrid approach that we used. It was a university school partnership model, actually. Um, but Omino has another question before she goes. So let's let her jump in before my question. So Omino. Okay. So my question would be to Sharonika. So I am coming from Uzbekistan, we're a male dominant country, and I was very shy student and Dr. Bonk made me to speak finally. I was very <laughs> dragging voice you girl, you know, very shy girl. Finally, <laughs> I'm opening up with Dr. Bonk's support. So I am, uh, my question is, how did you build self-efficacy, you know, confidence in, as a woman in your country? How did you become a leader? and how did you balance your life as a woman? And Sharonika, before you Thank answer you. that question, yeah. I know I know you're having trouble with your internet hearing, um, but you're speaking, we hear you perfectly. So, you know, okay. uh, there doesn't seem to be a problem in your, in, in your speaking coming to us at least. Okay. I, okay. I can hear you clearly. Yeah, okay, yeah, I, I heard the, the question and it sounds very familiar. So, <laughs> well, <laughs> I've been like you. I mean, some would say I was not talking. He Now he says you were not talking. Uh, you were very shy. Yes, uh, I mean, that's our cultural situation, you know. Uh, in uh, certain cultures, it's like that. We are very shy to speak out. You just listen to. We are used to listening to, you know, teachers that and think, I mean, <laughs> take everything uh, without, we are, we are not questioning anything. But I think the collaboration, that's another impact that I had. Uh, I mean, well, uh, one thing is uh, my exposure to um, graduate studies at uh, Wollongong University of Australia. I think that that was the greatest uh, time things changed in my, my sh uh, going out of my shyness and uh, becoming more innovative because John Hedberg was my supervisor, you know. Um, oh, well, I've been, I was there when, when, when he was at Wollongong. It's a great place. Oh, wow. Great place. I, I was probably ran into you. Were you, were you there in 2001 or 2002? Yeah, 2000. I, I left in 2000. Oh, I just missed 2000, you. 2001, okay. 2000, 2001, yeah, I left. Uh, so, uh, I mean, that was the time where, you know, uh, this technology, because you're scared of technology, you're scared of asking for anything, you're scared, you know, everything, you're like, not scared, you know, you're shy, yeah, I think shy is the word, but then uh, when uh, I, I was challenged, I mean, because my doctoral, I was the only one who selected technology at that time, because we didn't have internet even at the, uh, Sri Lanka at that time. When I went there, we were exposed to internet. And my I am the first one in Sri Lanka to do a PhD in e-learning. Uh, so <laughs> you see how it impacted on me. So after coming back, I want to implement all these things I have learned new, but uh, sorry, it was not possible once I came here, uh, that was there. But when we had this workshop with Som in e-learning and later on with Scenario, well, he was speaking the same thing that I have learned. So that was the motivation. Well, little by little, I got empowered. I went out because I think that uh, facility, that mentorship, I, I would say that uh, Som is a great mentor for me. Uh, so I think that mentorship, uh, listening to people and then allowing you to, you know, come out with your, I mean, you might be having a lot of ideas, but then you're shy to come up with it. But he, I think he got 
the potential inside me. I mean, if I speak about, sorry to speak about myself, but I think that's a very good example because when you were saying, I, I thought, okay, there, my goodness, that was me. So uh, now, now I am trying to do the same with, I have been, I mean, uh, now I think I'm talking too much. Uh, <laughs> at time, I was not talking at all. <laughs> but that's what happened to me over the two decades. But now I'm doing the same thing with my staff, my teachers. I call them my teachers because give them the opportunity. Uh, I mean, feel them empowered. And I, I mean, even in our classes, teachers won't talk. You will just listen. You will just listen, but without uh, even asking. But you have to follow. So that's why all of even my, uh, you know, the sessions with teachers are like workshops because you are, you are forced to ask. Uh, even our teachers, we sort of there's a compulsion, compulsion. The you know uh, is necessary to some extent, and the support, compulsion and the support and appreciation. I think appreciation is another thing. Uh, you know, when you see that uh, sometimes you, you see what you say might not be accepted or you might be get laughed at or, you know, that is also there. The language problem is there, you know, talk, you know, all these issues are there. Uh, but technology, now I have teachers who have not touched a computer, who have not touched coming to my class and ending up buying up laptops and typing on their own the whole dissertation, you know, that sort of teachers. So that's very satisfying for me because I went through the same same process and I'm helping my Asom has been my mentor for doing all these things and I, I'm doing I'm following suit I would say so you're following you're helping based on what you your journey was like I took correspondence and television to get into grad school and then studied distance learning so same kind of thing I got interested in how my life changed and helping people have their life change I'm sure some would have the same kind of story and why he entered this field you know, um, before I ask my question, so Sam, why did you enter this field? Um, and what was the field like when you first got into it? What, 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 and what has changed? A short, short answer, the shortest answer that I can give you is I, I, I grew up in, in a small Pacific Island country in Fiji. The obvious choices were to be a teacher or, um, you know, the few jobs available. So the easiest one was to get into teaching, go and do an undergraduate degree and start teaching. Uh, those are the obvious choices. I mean, I, uh, I am unlike Nida. I'm very talkative, you know. So I, I wanted to be a lawyer, but, uh, <laughs> but, 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 you know, I, when I started teaching, you know, the, the idea of being with a bunch of people, young, aspiring minds like yourself, which is fascinating for me. I walk into a classroom in those days. It was classroom. And you blabber on right or wrong, and then you go up in the field and play footy or soccer or rugby with these kids, you know, and then and then go home. What a day as opposed to sitting in an office or in a law court, you know, fighting your cases. So I was quite convinced that teaching was a fun thing to do and make a living. So I, I got a job that way. So when I did a bachelor's degree, then I thought, oh, this is not enough. You know, I... I need to go a bit further. So it led to further qualifications in education. Had I been a lawyer, I would have studied law or medicine, I would have studied medicine. So I kind of had an interest in teaching, not by, by nature, but by opportunity. That was the thing that was available. So I did that. And, and, and it was very good that this, when I started my PhD in 1987 in, in Montreal, can you imagine what life would have been at the time? I don't think so, because there was no web, there was no mobile phones, there was no internet connectivity. So how did I find out about this program? Well, that's a long story, to, but cut it short, I was able to find this program. And I, and that, as Sharonika says, really changed my life in so many different ways. There are a few watersheds in your life, like getting married, having a baby, you know, we're doing a PhD that changes your life, you know, significantly apart from illness and those other bad things that happen to people. So, so these things happen to us, and I'm pretty sure that what you're doing, Unida, is is and, and other people is going to change your life substantially, you know, considerably. Uh, and, and it did mine. And I came to Australia and so on and so on. So educational technology was a, a, a natural progression for me. Short answer to your question. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. So the technologies have changed dramatically. The methodologies have also changed dramatically. From my experience, we've moved from very, as you mentioned earlier, uh, Cook and Campbell or 
uh, Stanley and what was it? Uh, Stanley, Stanley and Campbell. Campbell Stanley, yeah. 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 Change from very quantitative to much more qualitative in nature. The field has moved much more qualitative, and, mm. and rightly so. And we're finding out a lot more, and we need to have much more qualitative research. But now I think a shift is moving to mixed methods, both yeah. qualitative and quantitative, to have both, whether it's quantitative first and then well, qualitative, or qualitative first and then quantitative. It depends on the study that one's doing and so forth. But we're going to read an article from both of you. And so I want, before we go, I'm going to ask a couple of questions. One is your 2021 article we're reading on week, four, on week 14, Impacts of Authentic Assessment on the Development of Graduate Attributes. You make some claims about the possible pathways to examine the impacts of authentic assessment um, activities on, the, on developing these graduate attributes. So what are examples of desired graduate attributes and how can they be fostered and what has been the reaction uh, of, of people to people of your article? Have you heard? Have you gotten much feedback on the article? Can you, can you tell us about the attributes and, um, and 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 how to foster them? That's that's a very critical question. I mean, uh, in the last half hour, we have said so many things about pedagogy, about scenario-based learning, problem-based learning, situated cognition, authenticity. I mean, if you walk away from this and you say, why? Why do we need, number one, what are authentic learning experiences and why? That's the typical, Katie was asking, why, why should I bother with this? My teachers are doing well, my students are doing well, well, highway, why bother with this? If I go start talking to authentic learning experiences, as, as, as Kurt was saying, people will run out of the room. So what we said is you try and make a connection with what is important. So what is important at the end of the day for any educational organization? It's, it's trying to develop uh, students with graduate attributes that will prepare them for meaningful employment in life or meaningful lifestyles, isn't it? I mean, it, isn't that a bottom, bottom line? The bottom line is apart from the degree and everything that you get, what else is an organization trying to do, an educational organization trying to do, is to develop graduate attributes in you so that you can, apart from being an accountant or a lawyer or, 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 or a physicist or, 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 a, or a medical practitioner, that you are able to do this basic problem solving, coping things in life. So what are those? A quick search on the web will tell you that you know you you need to apart from having subject matter knowledge you need to be able to think problem solve communicate with people speak up and articulate a point of view as 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 uh, Anita was saying you know uh, leadership you know develop a project carry that project through and and complete it and bring it to completion uh, and act with with the uh, authenticity I mean uh, with 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 uh, integrity and and uh, ethics and and those sorts of things. At the end of the day, this is what education is all about, isn't it? So isn't it a good question to ask, how can you, or how does your assessment of learning or your learning strategies promote those kinds of things? Because if it doesn't, then your teaching and learning needs to change because if your end product or your output is graduate attributes and this idea of the whole person, a, a competent professional, then you got to look at where your learning and teaching is coming from, isn't it? It's trying to close the loop. So when we were going on and on about authentic learning and authentic assessment, you know, we thought that it, it'd be a good idea to see how our design of authentic assessment promotes those graduate attributes. And we tried to make that connection in this article, eh, Shronika? So Sharonika, do you have a slide related to this answer or? Well, uh, sorry, I didn't prepare a slide. I thought it's coming in a different session with this authentic assessment, as you mentioned. Uh, okay, I didn't prepare a slide, but uh, I can give the link to uh, the article because we identified seven uh, generic graduate attributes. I have the article with me now, but sorry, I don't have a slide here. Uh, but uh, so if I may just uh, read out, it's scholarship. I mean, these are generic graduate attributes. We identified the, the specific graduate, graduate attributes and categorized them into seven generic GGAs, generic graduate attributes, scholarship, application, critical thinking, creativity, self-regulation, problem solving, and self-directed professional development. 
right? Mm -hmm. So uh, what, what we were trying to do through our authentic assessments, which we had designed, how uh, these assessments help them develop these, uh, these attributes. So uh, we had uh, actually those were very, we uh, had a very, um, it was all um, qu qualitative analysis, but uh, uh, okay, Qu qualitative analysis of their assessment, the assignments they submitted, you know, because the assessments are not just written things, some were concept maps, some were like, you know, different types of assessments were there, authentic assessments all linked. So we had uh, actually, uh, three different types of uh, authentic assessments, uh, you know, uh, creating something, uh, you know, creativity, and then uh, sharing it and collaborating around the group of people discussing around that was an assessment, and then reflecting on uh, what they have achieved. So all these things were assessments, which were linked with their real life situations. And we had a very um, lean, uh, you know, in depth analysis of the all these assessments. Uh, and we had, of course, uh, interviews with these participants as well. And the marks, they sometimes the marks does not really show how it has impacted. So we had both qualitative and quantitative uh, use, use the mixed methods approach. Uh, we tried to see how, and then we did the, you know, the quantitative, uh, this, uh, find out the relationship between these um, attribute uh, assessments and the attributes, uh, how the assessments have helped them develop these uh, attributes. So, uh, well, I will share the uh, link uh, of the article, which gives the whole thing. And we created a rubric, you know, to uh, do this. Uh, we used a rubric. Uh, we got it validated and the whole, it, it was, uh, you know, working with so on research articles is not easy. You know, <laughs> it, it's, it's a very lengthy process of, you know, every minute thing is important, the development of the right uh, instrument to capture these things and how to test is go through the whole process of this very intensive process of doing this. And yes, so, I mean, all these, our research have been like that, the journal articles, uh, this is the most recent one. Uh, so that also, it was very uh, in-depth uh, research, I think. Um, well, we didn't get any direct responses, I don't know, but I, I, I don't know whether so might know, uh, you asked about any responses to that. That was, uh, that article is published as part of a special issue published, edited by Diane Conrad from, uh, from uh, Toronto, Athabasca University, um, and a former editor of Eurodol, which is the International Research Review of Open Distance Learning. So Diane and, and her colleague, Gabby Whithouse from UK, from Lancaster, I think, edited a special issue on assessment in online learning environments. So this article is part of it. So I strongly encourage you to look at that whole issue because there's a whole bunch of other articles there. Uh, and, 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 not, not, and, and interestingly, from various parts of the world like South America. So you get a good collection of experiences on, on how you can make the connection between teaching, learning, assessment, and, and graduate attribute because, because, because that's the bottom line, isn't it? So we've gone a, a bit over tonight, and I really appreciate I put it everyone. in the chat box. Uh, by I, the way, sorry, I put the link in the chat box. I appreciate everyone staying longer here tonight. Assam has agreed to come back in the fall to talk to my R seven nine five class and dissertation prep because he's done a new book uh, on publishing. But before we go, I, I, I'd like Sam to give a, a two or three tips or four tips on how to publish, and maybe Sharana can add one or two tips on publishing. Uh, and I think we could all benefit from that. So Sam, since you just did the book on, the edited book on that, can you give us a couple of things that lead us to next fall when we hear from you again? You, you, uh, thanks, Kurt. Yeah, I mean, you, 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 as I understand, you are early uh, graduate students. These are early days for you, so you're probably not writing a lot. But one of the things that is very important right now for you is make sure that you understand the literature. Read as, as broadly and widely as you can. Make sure you've got the breadth of knowledge, the depth will come later. So don't worry so much about deep dive right now. Make sure you've read everything. You know, don't don't think that your know, OER is the next big best thing than than sliced bread or something because they, they, there was a lot around before. So an understanding of the literature, a grasp of the literature is very important. 
Well, whenever you ask a researchable question, whenever you ask a research question, make sure that it's researchable. A research question is not necessarily a researchable question. For example, I can ask a question like, does God exist? Well, yeah, good question, but is it researchable? Can I actually collect data that would be valid and reliable to answer that question? So research methodology is very important. So make sure that you understand the difference between a research question and a researchable question. But always at the end of the day, ask why. Is it a worthwhile question to ask? Who wants to know? Why bother? You can ask any question you want, but what contribution does it make to anyone? I mean, as an editor of the journal, 85% of the articles I receive, and every day in my inbox, there's three or four articles from very senior professors that get rejected before even I send it out for review. You know why? Because it is meaningless. So somebody has spent eight months to a year writing an article and suddenly someone like me says, what's the point? Why, why did you bother with it? Who needs to know? Why, why do you care? So make sure that you spend your time wisely. Ask a question that is worth asking. Don't just pursue everything that is worth asking. Thanks, Sam. Uh, Sharonika, you have any tips to add or guidance? Okay, uh, just uh, to add what Sam has said, as I said, I mean, he has been guiding me in my research work as well. So he was always insist insisting on the methodological rigor. You know, you have to maintain the methodological rigor of any research you do so that it gives you. So I think that that's something I have learned uh, uh, which is very important, uh, the methodology you are using. I mean, literature, of course, uh, you had to read a lot. Uh, what has, you know, the what's there in the uh, literature. And then the methodology is very important because that's, uh, because if, if it goes wrong or if, if there are flaws, you won't get the output, of course. So uh, that's, that's sort of what I would like to add. Uh, and to select the, uh, most appropriate research uh, approach uh, uh, for that particular thing. So now, now we realize uh, what, as I, as I mentioned earlier, now we, we are using the design-based approach because we realize that's the most appropriate approach in what we are doing, you know, in our projects that, that seems uh, that we, we saw that's the most uh, suitable approach to take, but it may not be in some other research. So likewise, the methodology is very important and keeping the rigor in the data collection, data analysis, uh, you know, that whole thing uh, to, give, uh, to give great emphasis on that. Thank you for that. For all of you, your ideas, your inspirations, your passions, and your useful summary. So you've summarized the article for us that we're gonna read in six weeks. Uh, and so they can, they're can they putting in their blogs together. Now, half of the students, they, they don't have to come to these section, synchronous sessions. They're, watch, they're gonna watch the archive of this. Um, and so we record this and then they're gonna watch this later and they blog on it. So they'll be, they might write to you afterwards. So, you know, um, if anyone wants, the emails of Sharonika or, or Sam. I think I have shared it with you already in the email I sent you. So, so do check that. Um, I want to get everyone to, to wave goodbye so that you can properly. And then, uh, uh, so I'll record that and I will stop this recording here. Stop the recording.